That's Jesus. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords, think through my mind, none of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 7 in the NLT. We have been uh, talking about what to do when you feel like God doesn't care. And that may have been one of your little secrets or maybe your big secret that as a Christian, you had the thought that maybe God doesn't care about me. And I got news for you. Everybody in has probably had that thought, uh, a feeling that you're abandoned, uh, wondering where is God? If he was good all the time, why did he allow this to happen or why did this situation happen? And I thought rather than ignore those questions after so many years and so many times, and even you ask the question yourself, that we needed to deal with that question. And one of the biggest things that we understood so far is that, you know, God never promised some of the things that, 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 that we expected from him. Uh, many believers have gotten the message that if God cared, life would be easy, and that if God really cared, problems would go away, and they would have whatever they wanted and whatever they needed if God really cared. That's what the message that believers got. But God never promised that. What God promised was his presence and his peace in the middle of trouble. You see, I, I begin, to, and the, more, the deeper I dive into this, I recognize in my own life, I felt like I, I had been trained to use my faith to either stay out of trouble or get out of trouble. <laughs> and that if I found myself in trouble, then I probably want to keep it to myself because that would indicate that maybe something's wrong with my faith or something's wrong with me or I've done something wrong. It's kind of like John 9 guy, you know, who has sent this guy or his parents that he was born blind like this? And Jesus said, neither. He said, but so the glory can be seen. And we see it over and over again where we'll look at that today, where we see situations that come up and, and, and uh, you know, I think it was Lazarus who died. My brother died. Well, why did my brother die? Or oh, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. He says, no, the issue is that we're going to see the glory of God. And that's the real answer, that a lot of things that we go through sometimes is just a setup so that we can see the glory of God, so you can see the glory of God in your life. Uh, no, God has not promised to take away the trouble. No, God has not promised to take away the uh, you know, the problem. I mean, certainly he could have taken the children of Israel out of the wilderness but chose to leave them there for 40 years. Boy, that's a long time. <laughs> but I guarantee you they learned some things. He could have taken, he could have poured water on the fiery furnace, I guess, but he didn't. Uh, he could have probably, you know, caused the lions to die. He didn't. There's no indication of God showing up saying, I'm just going to Every time you have a challenge, I'm going to remove the challenge. But that's what we think. We think, well, I'm going to use my faith to remove the challenge, or I'm going to remove, use my faith to, to us to, to stay out of the challenge. And, and no, 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 God says, I want you to get to know me, and you're not going to know me until you know that I am with you no matter what you go through. And that really helps you. It helps you when you've been diagnosed with a disease or something, and and, and, and you're like, oh, God, why don't you move the disease? And God says, no, I'm going to be with you every step of the way. You begin to see the Apostle Paul. He says, Lord, I have this thorn in my flesh, 
uh, a messenger for Satan sent to buffet me. Get rid of the thorn. In fact, Paul said, I asked three times, and he never got rid of it. And then Paul got it. He says, wait a minute. My grace is sufficient for you. And so I, I want us to mature to, a, to this next level. This next level that says, no matter what I'm facing, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what trouble shows up, I'm going to use my faith to be grateful that your presence is here, that your peace is here, and you, you're going to lead and guide and protect me and take care of me in the middle of it. And when it goes, it goes. But my focus is not on the trouble leaving. My focus is who is here with me? Because your mama, she might be gone. Your daddy might be dead. You might not have no friends around you at that time. And you need to know that God is with you no matter what you're going through. It gives a whole new insight of Psalms 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, the Lord's with me. You're with me. Your rod, your staff, it comforts me. You prepare a table before me, not in the presence of your friends, but the table is prepared in the presence of your enemies because God wants your enemies to see the glory of God working through your life in the middle of the wilderness. Glory be to God. And some of you can sense that God is getting ready to show out in your life. You got to know that you have not been going through all the things you've been going through for no reason at all. God's preparing you. His glory is about to be seen. His glory is about to be realized in your life. And I say this morning, hold on, praise God. Everything is going to be all right, praise the Lord. Amen. So, this morning, we want to talk and take this a little further. How much does God really care about me? How much does God really care about me, or does God really care about me? You know, not just to respond to, you know, you know to that question we had before, but does He really care about me? We want, to, we want to really give you some ease where that is concerned. First Peter chapter 5 and 6 says, So humble yourselves under the mighty hand, of, under the mighty power of God. And at, the, uh, and at the right time, he'll lift you up in honor. Humble yourself and at the right time, and at the right time. It's, no, it's not if God's going to do something, but when. Yes. Some, say this out loud. Say, not if, not if but, when. but when. And so, we, we, we've got to understand that God knows the perfect time to do it. He knows the perfect time. He says he will lift you up in honor. Somebody says, well, what do I do in between the I believe I receive and there it is? What do I do in between the I believe I received and, and, and he lifts me up? Well, that's where we begin to marvel at how he takes care of us in the middle of those things. And that's something that each of us have got to experience in our own lives, man. And look at verse 7. He says, uh, give all your worries and cares to God. Now, are you doing that? Are you doing that, or have you done that? Are you giving all of your worries and all of your cares to God? I know it's a challenge sometimes. I know you're saying, well, you know, Pastor Dollar, I can't help, I just worry. Well, worry is a negative form of meditation. And you don't want to worry because worry can be a power that can cause things to show up in your life. The thing you worry about the most shows up and it appears into your life. He says, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you worrying. Think about that. God loves me so much, he says, give me your worry. Wow, that's big. That's a relational God who says, give me your worry. I don't want you worrying. And yet, there are lots of things we worry about. We make room for worry instead of making room for peace. He says, give all your worries and your cares to God. Why? Why do you want me to give my worries and care to you. He says, because I care about you. That's a God who says, I care about you. Give me your worries. I know what happens when you carry the worry and the stress of it and the pressure of it. I know all, you know, at, at one point it, it seems like something so intangible, so what's the big deal? But God knows that carrying that intangible worry and care 
will eventually produce something physical in your body, and all of a sudden your body begins to respond to the worry and the care, and things happen that God doesn't want to happen. That's how much God cares for you. He says, I'm dealing with the root issue. Give me your worry. Give me your care because I care. Don't ever question uh, God like where his care is confer- it's concerned. And that's what this message is about today. We're going to look at how much God cares for us. Give me your worry. Give me your care because I care for you. I don't even want you going to bed worried. Some people wake up worried. And that's, that's sad. You go to bed worried. You wake up worried. That, that will mess with you. That will mess with you. And God doesn't want that to take place. Why? Because he cares for you. So God absolutely cares about people. God absolutely cares about their feelings and the problems they're facing. So let's resolve some some questions that we have about God's care. Here's the first question. Does God care about my happiness? Somebody says, what? Yeah, that's a question you've had. You might not have asked it, but does God care about my happiness? Because the enemy would love to get you to the place where You know, you start thinking, well, God doesn't doesn't really care about my happiness. And then you'll have preachers that'll say, you know, it ain't about your happiness, it's about your holiness. (laughs) Praise the Lord, that's about the holiness. You need to be more holy, trying to be happy. You need to be holy. Well, you know, God wants you to be happy. You don't have to dismiss one for the other. He wants you to be happy. Say it out loud. God wants me happy. <laughs> and so when you look at this, God created our senses, your, your touch, your, your taste, your, your eyes, your everything. He created our senses as conduits of enjoyment. In other words, He's given you your, your sensory mechanisms mainly so you can have enjoyment. You, you've got eyes so you can look at things and ears so you can hear beautiful things and, and, and taste so you can taste beautiful things and smell so you, all of that are, are, is, it has been given to us by God so we can enter into enjoyment. He gave us eyes to see majestic landscapes and, and, and colorful sunsets. I'll never forget when I was in, 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 in uh, South Africa and I woke up and in the window and there was tabletop mountain and there was a cloud that was laying on that mountain like a tablecloth. And I said, oh, what my eyes behold. And that was an enjoyment, something that I enjoyed. He gave us ears to hear the heart-stirring sound of music, the enjoyment of it. Now, I don't enjoy all music, but, you know, need a bacon to them, and, you know, I enjoy <laughs> giving you the mustang I have. <laughs> you know. You're supposed to listen to sign me up for the Christmas. Jo- no, I want good music, you know. Praise, praise the Lord. Let's go on. We get to smell the morning dew. We get to smell the sizzling pork, the sizzling pork bacon in the kitchen. <laughs> Not that other bacon, pork bacon. Somebody said that ain't good for you, but it sure smells good. <laughs> my, my youngest daughter heard on the news that they were having a shortage of bacon. She almost started crying. <laughs> the enjoyment, laughter between friends, that, 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 that all comes from God. It's all God's idea. Christian people get together like they're not supposed to laugh. I don't know what, I don't know where that came from, but God wants you to enjoy your fellowship. He don't want everybody getting around, you know, feeling like, do I have my issue covered up good because I don't want them to know what I'm really going through. Listen, the body of Christ has perfected phoniness, and you and I have made our idea, made our mind up, we're not going to be phony. It's okay for us to be who we are. It's okay for us to be who we are with with, with flaws and all. And thank God, because sometimes those flaws can be used to help somebody else prevent them from going through something you've already gone through. But how are we ever going to do that if everybody acting phony when we come around one another? That's not what God is. God wants us to look at each other's life, share what we have, the good part, the, the ugly part, the nice part. Now, there might be some private parts you can't tell everybody. But you got to realize that you have holy is a holy relationship. You got the inner court relationship. You, you got to realize where, where those people are in your life. You don't share, you know, people in your holy is a holy are the only ones you share it with. Now, our court people don't need to be hearing what holy is a holy people hearing. 
Amen. But God doesn't mind you sharing. You know, we, we even demonstrate our phoniness in just simple salutations. How you doing today? Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I, I, I ain't asked you all that. I ain't asked you all that. You're trying to avoid just, just authenticity, just real transparency can become a big ministry tool that can bless people's lives, but church folks don't know how to do it. There are men in who are single, and they look at some single woman, and they want to get with them, but they don't know how. Their religion is keeping them from going up and just simply being a gentleman and say, hello, how you doing? My name is Charles Greer, and I'd like to um, ask you out for some coffee or something, and, and if you don't mind. You don't even know how to do that. You, you go through all of this stuff, you know, oh, Lord, is that the one? It, ain't nobody trying to get married to you right now. It ain't, ain't, ain't all about that. We, 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 we act weird. We just really act weird sometimes, you know? People are weird. They're weirded out. I, I, I weird out over folks when I just say hello and they just can't simply, you know, reply. They got to go deep with me. Hey, how you doing? We know a guy like that. He, I, we were just speaking to him. Hey, how you doing? Whoa! And after a while, it's like, uh-uh. We've got to understand that God had made us to perfect phoniness, man, that God wants us to be real and he wants us to laugh. He wants us to enjoy one another. I had a lady write me one time. She said, you know what? I used to enjoy you when you were serious, but now that you do all this laughing and stuff in church, it's, 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 it's hindering the anointing in my life. I said, poor baby. Laughter, the Bible says, works good like medicine. And get with people that you enjoy. Enjoy life. I wish I could say I command you to enjoy life, but I, ain't, I can't be commanding nobody. I have to command myself. Enjoy life, man. Enjoy the holidays that are coming up. Enjoy the day. Enjoy this week, praise God. Enjoy life. I'm enjoying life. I've had some time to, to, to make movies again. I mean, I, in fact, I got one coming out tonight on TV One at 7 o'clock, a Christmas movie. I'm enjoying life. I'm, in, I'm enjoying life. I'm not sitting back. Oh, well, you know, it's so hard <laughs> to get along. It's so, listen to this, hard, hard to get along. Imagine that. It's so hard to get along. <laughs> just can't hardly get along. I can't hardly get along. Just can't hardly get Seriously? I don't see no joy in that at all. Turn to your neighbor and say, enjoy life. <laughs> Look at James chapter 117 in the NLT. James chapter 117 in NLT. And I know you look at me weird. People think I'm off just the rockers. I mean, this guy's sitting up here and telling these people they need to enjoy life. And tell them, I'm going to keep doing that because I have a relationship with God and he assures me that he wants us to enjoy life. He says in verse 17, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. Whatever is good and perfect, mature, complete, is a gift coming down to us. All good things, any good thing that ever happened to you is from God. And God wants some good things to happen to you. And David said, I had to believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God wants you to see and experience the goodness of the Lord while you are alive right now. Well, I'm just going to wait down and go to heaven. Listen, it's going to be awesome in heaven. It's going to be amazing when we get there. But God wants you to have a little heaven on earth. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let me set some of the men free. So if you'll see a lady, make sure you look at her hand now. Make sure she ain't got no ring on it. And I don't want you to get punched out. <laughs> They're beautiful single women in this church. 
There are amazing single men in this church, and y'all act like y'all don't know that. You don't have to go to no club. I'm just trying to set you free. Now, don't get crazy no, after church. Hey, mama, what's happening? You're going to get hurt. They don't play that. Their name ain't no mama. You're going to have to come correct or don't come at all. And put a little mint in your mouth before you go up to her. You come up to me, would you like to go eat coffee with me? And she smell that breath. She's like, ooh. Uh, not, 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 no. Amen. Let me get going. <laughs> All right, so here's the deal when we talk about this happiness. Our problem is not in our desire for happiness. Our problem is seeking happiness outside of God. The problem is not with our desire to have happiness. The problem is, is we're trying to seek happiness outside of God. And any time you try to seek happiness outside of God, you're going to get involved in something called idolatry. Idolatry is when you place something above God in more value. In other words, God is no longer first place. You have now replaced God with something else. You have now assigned a greater value to something else than you do God. And so what happens, rather than you understanding the enjoyment that God wants you to have in Him, what happens often is that we're not valuing God like we should. And so now we're looking to try to get happiness in the thing that we've placed above God. And so that's what the problem is. And people say, well, you can be happy in God. Well, I, don't, I really don't believe all that. And, and so now that's where the journey goes. You're now taking a journey and you're trying to go down a, a road or a path where you're trying to achieve happiness outside of God. And you bump into hurt, disappointment, expectations are not filled. You operate in a worldly perspective where you feel like I've got to get validation and in order to be happy, I've got to to be accepted in order to be happy, all of these weird things in order to try to achieve happiness outside of God. So the problem has never been God doesn't want you to be happy. The problem is you're trying to achieve it outside of God, and it's going to always be a pseudo happiness. You're never going to quite be happy, maybe for a moment, maybe for a day, maybe for a week or a year, but it seems to dwindle away because any happiness without God is happiness that has an expiration, and God doesn't want you to have that. But in Him, oh my God, it just gets gooder and gooder and better and better. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's look at the next question here. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you know we got to trust God and, and, and trust God's plans for our lives? Let, let me show you one more thing before we move on. Look at James. Uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11. Jeremiah 29 and 11 in the uh, NLT. We got to trust in God's plan, especially when it doesn't make sense. You ever had God do something in your life and it, it, it's just, it's not making sense? Why am I going down this path? I've got to trust in God's plan for my life. And God has a plan for everybody's life, and I got to trust in it. Look at Jeremiah 29 and 11. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. <clears throat> the plans for you, he says, they are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. So God says, I know the plans I have for you, and they're good plans. They're not going to bring disaster. You yielding to God's plan for your life is going to be good. You yielding for God's plan for, 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 for your living is going to not bring, it's not going to be disastrous. Some people have been convinced, if I do what God wants me to do, it's going to be disastrous. I'm going to be broke. I'm not going to be happy by doing what God wants me to do. Oh, and I've come to discover in my life that is wrong because his plans give you a future, and his plan 
gives you hope. And the thing we should be praying for every day, God, I thank you for the plan of God in my life. I thank you for the will of God in my life. I want your will for my life. I want your plan for my life. I don't want to just do what I want to do. I want, I want you to give me the purpose and the plan that you have for my life. And he says, I know it. He says, I know exactly why you exist. And when I made you, I applied a plan to go with your life. I don't know about you, but I want to discover the plan for my life. I don't want to come up with it when, it's all, when it already exists. I don't want to live 60 years of my life and discover the whole time I've been beating against the, 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 the everything that's trying to turn me. God, what, what do you want me to do? And a lot of times you discover the plan for your life just by paying attention to how you're wired, the things that are already on the inside of you, the desires that are already clicking in your life. And God begins to lead you down there. Here's the second question. Does God care about my problems? Does God care about my problems? Well, let's look at something in St. John chapter 11, and uh, let's answer this question. Does God care about my problems? I'll tell you what, I've asked that question, and I'll tell you more than once. Does God care about my problems? I'm going to look at a situation here dealing with the raising of Lazarus, and I want you to see what was going on here, and I'll make some commentary about it. John chapter 11, verse 1, he says, And a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. So they had obviously said that, you know. They knew Jesus cared about them, was close to their family. We're going to let him know and see if he cares. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. And he didn't move immediately. For the next two days, he stayed where he was, even after he got the message. I'm sure even as some of you who are reading, it's like, wow, didn't really look like he cared. He stayed where he was for two days. Uh, and then let's move over here to, I'm not going to read the whole story for time's sake, verse 17 through 21. So when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days, four days already in the grave. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. Now, I wondered about this. I underlined this in my Bible, but Mary stayed in the house. I wonder was she a little disturbed. Jesus is here. I, I, you know, I ain't feeling him right now. I mean, she was human. She might still have some kind of issue with, you know, we sent you word in time enough for you to come and do something. But you stayed for two days, and now he's been, been buried for four days. And so Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Huh. And she said, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus kept saying, Listen, you don't get it. I am the resurrection. I am the life. This is not over until I say it's over. Huh? How many of you think, well, ain't no use to praying no more? I mean, God, if you'd have did this before the doctor found this, it would have been fine, but it's too late now. They done already found it. They done already said what it is. If, you, if you'd have did something before I came to the doctor, and then you just quit. You just give up. You just, you know, you know, the whole time you've been saying, I'm healed. The whole time you've been quoting Scripture, the whole time. And then the doctor say, oh, yeah, you got it. It's right there. I see it. And you're like, well, I ain't no use to me saying nothing no more. No, I, I'm encouraging you, don't change. 
If you started off with I'm healed and you continue with I'm healed and you, 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 you heal no matter what. Somebody says, well, what if they die? I said, what a way to go. Go in faith, praise God. And then he said in verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, the issue is, does God care? A deep anger swelled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. He said, where have you put him? And, and, and I wonder why, why uh, several times it mentions that he was angry. They still didn't know him. You still don't know who you're talking to. And I think it's true in this room today. When crazy things happen, as many times God has delivered you. Situations still keep coming up, getting you to doubt. You still don't know him. You're still not convinced that he's a way out of nowhere. You're still not convinced that, that he's a doctor in a sick room. You're still not convinced. You forget to count what he's already done. And if for some reason this trouble is somehow greater than what you've already experienced, he says, you still don't know me. There ain't nothing you can go through that's going to be greater than who I am in your life. He said, where have you put him? He said, come and see, verse 35. Then Jesus wept. Well, they really didn't understand what was going on there. For, for about 35 years of my ministry, I didn't understand what was going on there. Jesus wept. They were like, oh, look at him. He's crying over his good friend. They knew he cared. But he wasn't really crying over his good friend. If you read on down there, Jesus says, I know you hear my prayer always. The question is, when did he pray? Because he said, I know you hear my prayer always. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And I'm thinking, did I miss something here? When did he pray? Oh, when he wept. He wasn't crying in sorrow. Listen, it don't even make no sense. If Jesus is angry because y'all don't know who he is, and he said he's a resurrection and, 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 and resurrection and the life, why is he crying in sorrow at the death that he is the solution for? So you know he's not talking about those kind of tears. Mm. When he wept, he was entering into the strongest, most powerful form of prayer known to man. And it's called the prayer of groanings. He was groaning in the spirit. I don't know if any of you have ever reached that level of prayer where you're praying in tongues and you're in the middle of praying. You've been praying there for about an hour or so, and all of a sudden you, you're not even praying anymore. You're, you're just weeping and groaning and moaning and trying to get something out, but there's a prayer of groaning that goes forth. And when he finished praying and weeping and groaning, he said, I know you hear my prayer always. I don't know what I said or what those groans meant, but when I, when I prayed, I know you heard it. Lazarus, come forth. I got a teaching on the prayer of groanings. But they knew he cared, not just because he wept or groaned or prayed, but because he raised his friend from the dead. There it is again. Why did Lazarus die? Watch this. So we can see the glory of God. So we can see the glory of God. I was, I was looking at this last night, and it came across my spirit. Glory, a manifestation of victory. A manifestation of victory. That's what, you're got, you're, that, that's what you're about to see. You're going to see the glory of God out of the trouble, out of the pressure, out of the situations that you've been going through. Get ready for the manifestation of victory. I heard that in my spirit. I said, I got to write that down. 
The glory of God is about to hit your life. The glory of God is about to hit your house. The glory of God is about to hit your relationship. The glory of God is about to hit your business. It's about to hit your finances. It's about to hit your marriage. A manifestation of victory! Ooh, Jesus. My goodness. God cares deeply for us. He knows exactly what we're going through and the pain we're facing. And just like Jesus was with Mary and Martha, he's deeply moved by our circumstances and what we're walking through. It may not feel like it, but he's walking right beside us through our pain. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you're with me. You're with me. You got to have heart surgery. You don't know what they're going to do. You, he's with me. So focus more on I have faith that he's with me. I have faith that he's going to take care of me. I have faith that he's right by me. He's comforting me, praise God. Quit putting so much uh, uh, emphasis on the trouble and start putting all of your focus on his presence, praise God. And then when you see his presence, you can have his peace. And then people look at you and say, how can you be so peaceful when you're going through this? And you can tell them, because I know I'm not alone. God is with me. And the question is, is, will you take a hold of his hand and, and let him comfort you? I've had to learn how to do that. I've, I've had to let him take my hand, God, comfort me. I, I, this is painful. This hurts. I don't understand. I don't know why. How long? When is it going to be over? God, take my hand. Comfort me. This is what I'm trying to teach you. A real, intimate relationship. A God who's present in a time of need, who won't leave you. And somebody says, well, I didn't know he was there. It's because you weren't paying attention. He's always been there. And it's when we recognize that he's always there and we can just yield to him is where we start walking in a peace that passes all understanding. We sleep peaceful at night. We wake up with joy in the morning. And people on the outside can't even tell you in the middle of a furnace. And after it's all over with, I'm like that. I don't like the talk until it's all over with because I want to see the full story to tell you how good God is. But I prophesy over your life, world changers, that a manifestation of victory is about to hit your life. The expiration of your trouble is about to come, and the manifestation of your victory is about to hit your life. Amen because we're talking about a God who will never leave you. Now, I know that there are some that will get up in the pulpit and say, well, you know what? God's not there because you hadn't been good enough. Honey, God said, I'll never leave you. Now, either he's telling the truth or he's lying. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you even to the end of the world. He didn't say, I'm going to stay with you only if you sinless, because the issue is you ain't sinless. I don't care how hard you try, you ain't sinless. What you say? You ain't sinless. Well, I ain't committed adultery. I, mean, I ain't talking about the Big Ten. I'm talking about you not sin is sin. Don't be talking about no. In order for you to say you're, you're sinless, you got you to in, inject some new rules. You got to divide it up and say, well, there's big sin and there's small sin. No, sin is sin. And you sin when you're rude to the waitress at the restaurant or committing adultery. You're sinful when you treat people in the wrong way and when you uh, do other stuff. You're sin and you need Jesus to, to, to present you faultless before God. You're never going to be able to present yourself faultless before God. You need Jesus to present you faultless before God. 
And the Bible says, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, hallelujah, and present you faultless before God. But you're going to need Jesus this whole life. It ain't never going to be a time in this life where you can dismiss Jesus and say, I got it, bro. You're going to need him all the rest of the day. You're going to need him tomorrow. You're going to need him all this week. You're going to need him Christmas, New Year's, and all of 2023. You ain't going to never not need him. I just want you to know that this relationship is real. I just want you to know that you, you don't have to spend the rest of your life playing church or debating about the Scripture. Spend time with Him. Get to know Him for yourself. And let Him become the leader and the guide in your life. And you'll see for yourself when you're talking to Him, when you're in the house by yourself, or when you're washing dishes, or when you're cutting the grass, you're talking to Him. And then one day, one day you just decided to just be quiet, and He started talking back to you. He started talking back to you. A God that hears you. But then he said, my sheep hear my voice. Why? They know me, and I know them. This is a personal relationship, not some play church religion where you got to keep these rules, and, and, and if you keep these rules, if you keep all these rules, then God going to bless you. Honey, if you could keep all the rules, you wouldn't need him. We need him. Amen. Amen. Here's the third question. We're going to get these questions in. Why doesn't God take away the hard times? If God cares for me, why didn't he take away the hard times? Look at John 14 and 1. St. John 14 and 1. If God loves me, why didn't he take away the hard times? How many of you have ever, in your lifetime, how many of you have experienced any hard time? One or two? All right, the rest of them, we're going to cast our lion demons in you right now. I don't know what's the matter with you. I ask you a question. How many of you have experienced hard times ever in your whole life? Thank you. That's everybody in here. If you didn't raise your hands, you're, you're lying to Lincoln, your breast stink. You're lying. Of course you have. Part of the definition of life is hard times. They might not be as hard to you now because you've already been trained by some of the stuff. Uh, look at this. These first three words. Well, actually, I'll, I'll take away the don't or do not let. Don't let. Do not let. Some theologians say that's a command. Do not let. Don't let. And, and the implication, the implied uh, word here is, you don't let. So it's, it's appearing that he is now here going to make us responsible for something. Don't let. God is letting us know that he's not going to keep our hearts from being troubled. He says, you do not let your heart be troubled. So he's like, I am making you responsible for not letting your heart be troubled, because you can let your heart be troubled, or you can do something to make sure it's, it, it, it's not trouble. Trouble's going to come, but it, it doesn't have to be heart deep. So he's saying, you're responsible for trouble in your heart. I'm making you responsible. And, and this seems so unfair. This blew my mind when I'm, I'm thinking like, what? He's not going to keep our hearts from being troubled. That's not what I was taught. I was taught God's going to be responsible for making sure my heart's not troubled. That's not what he said. He says, you don't let your heart be troubled. 
Oh, my goodness. So if your heart's troubled, you're letting it. You know what he's saying? I'm giving you authority over your heart. You'll be surrounded by trouble. You'll be confronted with trouble. You'll be confronted with pressures. You'll be confronted with stress. Do not let. Am I, I, I apologize for screaming. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> I just heard that. It almost hurt me. I'm hollering so loud. You're like, dude, we got you. We're hollering, so we got it. The speakers are working. <laughs> Apologies. Do not, that blew my mind. And, and so I'm sitting here with my heart troubled. And he's like, what are you going to do about it? And I'm like, what are you going to do about it? Where are you? Why am I feeling like this? He says, you're letting it happen. You're letting it happen. You have authority over what goes in your heart. This is your heart. The devil just can't do stuff there. You have to let it in. You have to make a decision. It's kind of it's like a parent who does everything for their children. <laughs> It's certainly not going to teach your kids as they grow up. It's not going to teach them anything by doing everything. I mean, they'll never learn the lessons from life. And the same is true if God takes problems and challenges and things away from us. We're never going to learn that. We're never going to learn that. Your son goes out and he gets a job, and then he quits the job, and then he moves back in with you, and he goes out and gets a job, and he quits the job, and he moves back with you, and he goes out and gets a job, and he quits the job, and he moves back with you, and you just keep taking the trouble of homelessness away from him. Two nights, that butt going to know how to keep that job. If I keep stepping in and taking the trouble away, you ain't never going to learn nothing. You mess that up with all of the, the little stuff that you get from Christian church stuff kind of stuff. Yeah, but God loved us, and God also let me go through a lot of hell. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. Yes, he did. And I learned some stuff. And it's rough. It's rough as a parent. And it's the same way playing with God. He doesn't delight in seeing you go through stuff because you just won't do what he asked you to do. I have adult children now. Our conversations are limited to one or two. After that, I won't say anything else. You could have listened to me and did it, but chose not to. So, you grown. You grown. You know more than everybody. You talking to me about how you don't you don't believe in working no eight hours a day. You, you don't believe it takes all of that. Fine. You don't know the difference between a hobby and a job. You grown. <laughs> but ain't no need of me fighting you with that because if you won't let me teach you, if you won't let God teach you, life will whoop that. to make it plain, Reb. <laughs> and I know because I was, I was the victim of that all the time. Oh, my children, they get me all the time. Well, Daddy, what I'm supposed to do? Oh, Lord Jesus, him. <laughs> and Taffy be like, you, you got to stop doing that, I know. And then you go behind and have it back. Him, don't tell your mom I gave you that. <laughs> I 
Here's the sad part. I had to look at the part I played in their pain. And I would do that with people in general. My heart was just so soft, you know. I'd pass somebody back the car up and lay a stack on them. Oh, I know the Lord is pleased. And this blew my mind. He said, that was none of your business. <laughs> yeah, but I, you, you said help the needy. He said, that wasn't none of your business. He said, that's the problem with your church folks. I tell you to do something, and you dismiss me instead of allowing me to guide you through that. I know who you're supposed to do that to, and I know who you're supposed to let alone. And then you end up getting used all the time, and now you mad at God talking about how people are and church hurt and all that kind of stuff. And God said, if you would have checked with me and let me be your guide and your leader, I'd have told you a long time ago, don't touch that, leave it alone. And what we do, we prolong their trouble when it could have already been completed, but you keep stepping in and messing the lesson up. Man, it's the same thing with our relationship with God. It's the same thing. God is doing something in our lives, preparing us for a great call, a great event, a great situation, and you don't come in here with your prayerless Christian self, <laughs> interfering with God's work and preparation of a gift. Sometimes people need a good dose of let loan. <laughs> All right, let me put it in, in English so you can understand. Let them alone. <laughs> leave them alone. Well, not necessarily leave them alone, but let alone. See, because none of my children, I didn't abandon them. I just abandoned them dead presidents. I didn't abandon them. <laughs> You'll find God doesn't abandon us. He's there with you. He's not taking away the trouble, but he's there with you. So as a parent, I want to be there with them, but I'm, I'm taking, I'm, hey, I'm, hey, I'm encouraging you. I'm praying with you. Love you. How's everything going? You can do it. Come on. Won't you do this versus doing that? And then I'm, I'm there with you, but I'm not going to take away the trouble. We're going to see how this can mature you. Daddy, my electricity off. You got blankets, baby? <laughs> I got some blankets for I bring you some blankets. Because you spent your money on something else. And God's trying to teach you about prioritizing your life. And some of you Christians do the same thing. You go out and buy a car that hurts you. It's too expensive for you. And God's trying to teach you. Don't be going out buying something to impress somebody else that don't care. You're trying to impress somebody that don't even care with something you can't afford. Somebody said, Pastor, where the love? Where the love? I thought the Bible said God is love. He loves me enough to walk with me through the valley of the shadows of death. And I guarantee you, by that time, I learned how to stop stressing. I learned how to stop worrying. I learned how to stop acting like I'm Superman and I can carry everybody's problems. Yeah, I knew that now. I knew that now. People get mad. Well, I called you. You didn't call me back. It don't bother me at all. I don't even know you, man. <laughs> I don't even know you. You know, sometimes your life can't hold the full capacity of the demands. And you got to be smart enough to know, you know, I got too many friends. I, I, I can't hardly do nothing because I got everybody call me. I, that's too many friends. You probably can take about five or six. You got 30. That's too many. You got to reduce that. You got to be smart enough to reduce that. It's not that I don't love you. I don't have no more room. I hope y'all come back to church next week. <laughs> Some of y'all looking at me like. <laughs> 
instead of taking life's hard lessons from us, oh God, he hands the responsibility over to us and leads and guides us through life's tough situations. And I'm seeing that in my life. I'm seeing that over the last three years, that these are tough situations, but I have his leadership. I have his guidance. I have his love. He knows how much I can take. And when it gets really hard, he just shows up and he does something. He doesn't take away the lesson. He just takes care of me through the lesson. I ain't gonna let my kids go hungry. No, no, you call me, I ain't got no food to eat. On my way. You gonna eat. I'm gonna take care of the lesson, but you, you still gotta get a job. So you gotta, you gotta ask God, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take, God takes care of you through everything. He doesn't just remove the, the trouble. He takes care of you in the middle of the trouble. And you're wondering, God, where are you? Why don't you move the trouble? Why don't you take the pain away? Why don't you die? Why don't you? You know, you know, yeah, I know, but I'm here. I know what you can take. I know what you can bear. And if it get rough, I'll take care of you in the midst of it. I'll cover you with my wings, hallelujah. I'll make sure nothing comes on you that's too heavy for you to handle. And if I have to, I got a way of escape, praise God, and we'll come back and do it again. But I got you. Yeah. So the question is, will you let God lead and guide you through the hard times you're walking through? I think I will, yeah. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 9 through 21 in the NLT. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse, uh, verse 19 through 21 in the NLT. Uh, this is a story about the children of Israel. I read this and I thought, certainly you could have resolved this, like, quickly. He says, but in your great mercy, you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The w they were in the wilderness. And he didn't take them out of the wilderness for 40 years. There was something that needed to take place. He says, but I didn't abandon you to die in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud still led them forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. I'm taking care of you. I'm not removing you out of the wilderness, but I got, you. I got guidance in the daytime and guidance at nighttime. Next verse. He says, you sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. He took care of them. He said, for 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. Look at that. I can't tell you how long you got to go through whatever it is you're going through. I, I, I figured just learn the lesson. Because one of the reasons they were there for 40 years, they didn't have to be there for 40 years. They were rebellious. I don't, I don't want to have to be somewhere alone because it's saying something about me. It's saying something about my character. It's saying something about me not getting what I'm, what I'm supposed to get in this. I want to hurry up and get what I'm supposed to get out of it and move on. I don't want to ha keep, ha listen, if you're having the same trial every month, you ain't some, it's something you're not getting. God help me to know the wisdom I need to get out of this so I can stay out of this. <laughs> the wisdom Paul got was his grace was more than enough for every situation for 40 years. But even though they were not getting it and they were rebellious, he says, all right, you've chosen to stay in the wilderness. I'm going to still sustain you, still take care of you, still lead you in the daytime and nighttime. I'm going to still make sure you got food and water. He says, watch this. He said, even though they were in the wilderness, he sustained them and they lacked nothing for 40 years. They lacked nothing for 40 years. Their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. Their feet did not swell for 40 years. 
They did a lot of walking and wandering. For 40 years, they lacked nothing. That's God's commitment. That I don't care what kind of wilderness you're in, I'm going to be in there with you. I don't care what kind of hell you're in, I'm going to be in there with you. Ask Jesus, I'm going to be in there with you. You didn't take Jesus for three days and three nights. Part of that was because prophecy was given that he had to stay. He didn't have to stay 40 years in hell. God was there with him. Wow. And I'm telling you, God is there with you. Next question. Does God care about me and what I want? <laughs> Does God care about me and what I want? As far as what I want, I, I, I don't know about you, but I sometimes set my heart on things only to discover later on that there are much better paths that I could be walking down. I set my heart on something, and I'm like, what in the world am I doing? I discovered there are a lot of better paths that I could be walking down. But God sees our desires, and even though they may not be his best plan for us, he sometimes allows us to start walking towards them. I've learned that lesson. I, I don't want to try to get you to try to do what I want to do. I want to find out what you want me to do. Now, a perfect example, if you have time to read this, is the prodigal son. I want what I want. Give me my inheritance now. Let's split it up now, and I'm going to go out and do what I need to do. And he lost all his money. He ended up finding himself in a, in a pig place, man, in the mud. And finally came back on him after he had done the wrong thing, doing what he wanted to do. Don't let doing what you want to do get you in trouble. He came back home to his father. Please read this, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. I trust you, but I'm going to read it because y'all might, might go home, y'all. <laughs> I know he said not to read it, but to read it, but I ain't got time. Look at this, Luke 15, uh, for the faith's sake of time. Uh, Luke 15, let's, let's look at verse 11, and I'll just go 11 through 24 real quick. Uh, he says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told his story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to get into that after he died, but he wanted now. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He, he, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into to the fields uh, to feed pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding, the pigs looked good to him but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he had to come to himself. He said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love, compassion, he ran to his son. He embraced him, and he kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house, put it on him, get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began.
he got what he needed out of his trial. And when you get what you need out of it, the party can begin. I declare over your life, let the party begin. Let the party begin. Here's the last question. Does God care about little things? Does God care about little things? Many times God shows up in small ways. Somebody texting you and had no idea that you were having a rough day. Hmm. Some random invite to dinner when you felt so alone. An encouraging written letter put in your box when you needed it the most. Yeah, God does things, and it's something about looking at the little things that he does. He cares about the little things. Like when I threw my back out one time, and I was like, oh, God, I received healing for my back, and he had to remind me. He had to get my attention because he had already done it. He said, check your back out. I was like, oh, yeah, thank you, Jesus. He's concerned about little things. Don't sit back and think God's not concerned about little things. He's concerned about how the bird's going to eat. And he says, you're a lot more valuable than the birds. The little things. He's concerned about it. It's a relationship. Talk to him about the little things. Oh, God, I just really don't like how I spoke to that person. Keep training me so I can be better at that. The God of the universe chose to honor you and the favor of man. The Bible says when he picks up the earth, it's like pick, picking up a grain of sand on his finger. And yet he's concerned about us. I'm so glad that I have a God living in me who I can talk to him about little things. When I got my feelings hurt, when I'm walking in self-pity, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, that's why I've got to eat grits. <laughs> He's concerned about the little things. God, I'm scared, but I'm pretending like I'm not. Help me. God, I'm lonely, but I don't want to let nobody know it because I don't want them to feel sorry for me. Help me. God, I feel inadequate and inferior, but I cover it up real well because as a man, I don't want to be, I don't want nobody to find my secret out. Help me. That's what builds this relationship. This is a concern about little things. My time's gone. A little thing, but I'm done. You get anything out of that? Would you lift your hand as a worship to God as we pray this little short prayer? Father, we get it. You care. We've been lied to. You've always cared. And today we receive your care. And we lift up holy hands, one without wrath and without doubt. And regardless of what happens in our lives, we trust you and declare that all is well in Jesus' name. Amen. For all that we shared this morning and for what I just shared with you, and the relationship we have with God and the great things that he has done and is doing, that's why our giving is a part of worship. It's taking the time to recognize this relationship that you're in. It's taking the time to say, Lord, you have been extraordinarily patient with me and good to me and amazing in my life and you're teaching me and raising me and training me and forgiving me and loving me and walking with me. I 
want to worship you with my gifts. I want to give unto the Lord glory due to you. It's due to you, Lord. I bring an offering, and I worship you in the beauty of your holiness. I bring an offering out of gratitude, out of honor, out of thanksgiving, not out of fear, not out, not out of necessity, not out of fear that you're going to be mad at me, that you're not going to help me, that you're not going to bless me. I do this because I want to because I know you, and you know me, and I am grateful. I bring an offering. That's what this is about. It's not about... Let me give you five rules in order for, if you want God to move for you this way or this way, you, let me give you these five rules. No. It's not about, you know what, if you don't, if you don't give to God, then heaven's going to be closed, you're never going to prosper, and things aren't going to work. No. That's not, should, none of those should be the motivation for it. Because if any of those things were the motivation for God moving, then His grace is no good. I give to you because I get to and I want to. And I want to do it out of a cheerful heart. <laughs> and I receive your love for me. And I am blessed to know that everything I give, you said and promised that you would multiply. And I thank God that you multiply my gift, but that's not my motivation for giving. My motivation for giving is very simply you. You are my motivation for giving. And I don't need anybody telling me a fable of what I need to do, and if I do this, then God will do that. God is, I'm letting him do whatever he wants to do in my life. Because if that's the case, then you'll start asking God a question. But wait a minute, Lord, I tithe. Why did I happen? I give. How can you let that happen? As if you paid him for something that he reneged on. No. I am honored and blessed to be able to give generously to the God who's always giving to me. If you need an offering or an envelope, raise your hands and the ushers will get one to you. If you're at home, <laughs> I just sense if there's ever a time to participate in this offering, do it now. Do it now where you're right in the center of this amazing understanding of God's relationship with you. Ooh, if you could only see the things that are going to happen. It's going to be a year where Goshen is going to be well supplied but Egypt is going to be in big-time lack. And the only way you'll know what's going on in Egypt is you got to look out the window to see it because there won't be any evidence of it in the ocean. Amazing. And God will deal with you. Don't let greed be responsible for wasteful spending in your life right now. Trust God to even teach you in how to do that and prepare you for anything that fallen systems will bring. And you're ready. You'll be more than able. God will guide you through any difficult times that are to come. He will guide you. Jesus is your game changer. He is your advantage. And you're going to be just fine. So when people tell you to the doom and the gloom, you, you must just let them know, listen, I, that may, maybe that's without Jesus, but I have him. I'm good. He got me. He's taken care of me before. He'll continue to take care of me now. Amen? If your offers are prepared, just a, let's, just, let's just pray and believe together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to give to you without wrong negative motivations but out of love and appreciation and thanksgiving and gratitude we give 
Oh, Lord, be blessed through these gifts that we honor you with today. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you at home, you can go ahead and click the buttons. And those of you here, ushers, you can pass the buckets. There are four ways to give that are on the stream for our e-church. There are also uh, those codes that you can use as well. Well, the Falcons ain't playing today, so I guess I'll just pray in tongues for them. <laughs> oh, I just, I love it. That's you. I mean, you can tell that's my team. Whether they're doing good or doing bad, I'm, I'm, at one time I thought they had football gods, but I think the football gods quit after a while, and it's just like, <laughs> but we'll see if we can get them back. I want to pray a simple prayer of salvation if you're here and you're not born again. If you'll pray this simple prayer with me, you can make Jesus the Lord of your life right where you're seated or even at home. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner, but right now I repent of my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. I receive the free gift of your forgiveness. Jesus, thank you for saving me. I believe in you and all that you've done and finished. In Jesus' name, I declare that I am saved. Amen. It's that simple. It's always be that simple. If you were to die right now, you would be absent from the body and present with the Lord. If you prayed that prayer of salvation with me today, just text the keyword, I'm saved. That's one word to 51555. Provide your name and email address, and we'll send you a free ebook as a gift to you today. Amen. And finally, if you're here today in the Dome or online and you'd like to hook up with World Changers Ministry here in College Park or our e-church, those of you who are here, if you'll get your personal belongings and come on down front, what we're saying is you think you found the church that God wants you to be a part of. You think you uh, have found a church alive that's worth the drive, you know. Uh, then respond to that, connect with us, and let's go ahead and grow together. You can come at this time. Those of you who would like to join the e-church, you can go to worldchangers.org and click the Join button at the top of the page. Text JOIN, W-C-C-I, that's all one word, to 51555, and we'll send you all the benefits of e-membership. And welcome to World Changers e-church, in Jesus' name. Anybody else? <clears throat> We good, we going, 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 we good, we good, we good. Father, we thank you for this young man that has come down, and I pray the blessings of God over his life. I thank you, Lord, you will use him and take him to the place of the call that you've put over his life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Sir, if you'll go this way. Oh, there's a young lady right there. Just follow that, that, that young man right there. Praise God. Hey, let's stand up for our final blessing. Thank y'all so much for taking the time to come to church and ignoring the clouds. Amen. You are not a fair weather Christian. Praise God. And now, according to the spirit of grace for every mountain every trouble every problem i shout grace grace that every mountain will be reduced to a molehill i declare protection over your life over your family over your children i place and declare a shield of protection over your home no hurt harm or danger comes over you you are psalms 91 equipped I declare in Jesus' name that doors that were closed to you will open. And I bind every demonic force that continues to try to come against you. That expires now. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And everybody said, 
Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a great day today.